All right, when we left off yesterday, we were talking about induction systems. And some of the point things that we pointed out were for what? It may be external to the engine. Uh, it may run completely external. It could run through the sump, external and partly through the sump. Uh, I don't have a lot of photos, but I have this one in here, so I'll just kind of pull this one up. And this one is actually more of a complicated one, but even so, it's not that complicated. We'll talk about turbos later, but here's a turbocharger down here. With the inlet, it's going to come through here, go through the compressor, and it comes out through here, and it goes through an intercooler. And that's part of the turbocharger, because when you compress air, it gets hot. So this particular aircraft has a cooler that cools the air back down. It's an air radiator. And then it comes up through here, and this way, and probably has a turbocharger on the other side coming up that way through the uh, throttle valve and then just off to the cylinders. So there's not a lot to them. <clears throat> the problem is you can see how they're connected. It's nothing more than a hose with some hose clamps. And when, uh, when I went to the IA renewal, it, a guy had a very interesting slide and, and uh, this reminds me of it. And what happened is of course you see the aircraft uh, they're all crashed and smashed and and uh, what happened is <clears throat> on a turbocharged aircraft mechanics had changed out a cylinder or done some maintenance and removed one of these these tubes here and they put the hose clamp back on they had missed where the where the clamp went so the clamp was kind of in the middle of nothing and the turbocharger you're going to find out will work quite well on the ground. It's not a big deal because the difference in air pressure between the external and the internal is about equal. And so it doesn't really create a problem. But as the aircraft goes up in altitude, the atmospheric air surrounding the aircraft engine gets more or less, less, and therefore there's a greater differential pressure, which means that it wants to blow these little couplings apart. And it sure did. <clears throat> so it blows this coupling right off, and along with it, this particular, this is this is made out of aluminum. This aluminum hose or uh, tube right off. How well is the engine going to run now? Uh, not at all. So you have this is massive open right here, sucking in air. Um, even if you can get air coming this way, it just it's just not going to work. So too much air, aircraft uh, crashes. So they're, as the term is, deceptively simple, but yet. It doesn't take a whole lot to really mess up and ruin somebody's day. But anyway, this is a Continental, uh, this would be an IO550, I believe. So that's a big one. TSIO550. Yeah. The left and right side, like mirror image of each other? I think so on this one it is, yeah. Because I see this tube coming from somewhere. So that means it's got to be air coming in this way because here's the throttle valve right up here. So if air is coming this way, it's going to be a probably turbocharged on the other side with an intercooler sitting right up there. Kevin, are there any shops that use checklists and things like this? Or? Every shop better use a checklist. It's, it's, uh, and I say that because uh, you're talking about an, on an inspection? Yeah, because those type of things that are simple, Oh, well, it depends on what you mean by a checklist. So, you know, let's, let's say I had to remove the cylinder, or worse, this one over here. And so I put it back on. Do I have a checklist that says, hey, make sure that you put on and torque the rocker covers, make sure that you put on the, the intake tube, and make sure, no, usually not. On an inspection, yes. So you're required to on an annual inspection, so I would have one that says, hey, check the integrity of the hoses and, and the, the tubes and look for chafing and stuff. But otherwise, no, that's where it's always good to have a second set of eyes. You finish everything off and then you get somebody who you trust to actually come up and really take the time to look at things and, and poke at things to make sure that it's right. All right, so let's see. So uh, we're mostly with the, the Lycoming, may run through the oil sump, yes. All right, so if it's running through the sump, it cools the oil a little bit, also warms the fuel-air mixture, which you could say gives better atomization. Was it designed that way? 
I have no idea. May have been simply due to uh, some room constraints. There wasn't enough room to do anything else the way Lycoming designed it. All right, and let's see. Also, this one may be a good example. Uh, maybe not. Let's see. I'm kind of looking at the length of these pipes. And they look different lengths. Lycoming, I know for a fact, is one manufacturer that will do this. They, they have what's called a balanced intake system. So some systems or I could say some engines use say use balance. balanced intake tubes. Now what that means is <clears throat> that they're all equal lengths. So all tubes are equal. And they don't have to be, which is a funny thing. So you'll see um, like on a six cylinder engine, if you think about a six cylinder engine, so right in the middle of the sump you could have all three of your intake pipes coming out. Well, it's a very short run from the middle one to the middle cylinder. A little bit longer from the front one to the front cylinder and so on with the, with the back cylinder. And so the, the one in the middle will be a shorter tube. But on balanced systems, they'll actually make all the tubes the same length. So you'll look at it, it'll come out of the, out of uh, wherever it's going to split from, and you'll see one tube, it's kind of way longer than it needs to be. It makes a turn or two coming around like, well, why would they do that? They could have shortened it by six or eight inches. A uh, perfect example of that is uh, across the street, we have a mock-up of a Lycoming with a turbocharger on the back. Look at those. That's a balanced system. And they come out and they, they curve all over the place so that they're all the same length. So you'll find one that is just long enough to work and all the other ones uh, are, are matched. So equal lengths. And let's see, why do I do that? <clears throat> Provides. That provides a uh, better, uh, more uniform fuel air mixture to each cylinder, to all cylinders. Is it open or closed? Closed. Is the air conditioner? Yeah. All right, we talked about the carburetor heater, too. What's a carburetor heater do? If you were here yesterday. Okay. How does it do that? Okay, provides warm air to melt or prevent or prevent ice. Where does that hot air come from? Okay. Oh, is it exhaust gas that they're just pumping through there? No. Okay. Uses a heat muff. Around exhaust. <coughs> Round the exhaust. Uh, let's see. So going back to the, our pictures. Here are some of the different systems. This one here is a Lycoming system. Pretty rude, crude, isn't it? So here you have uh, a scat duct that comes through there's and uh, just clamped on there. So warm air is going to just kind of come through here. And there's a little screen right there. Uh, it'll keep out birds. And <laughs> that's about it. And uh, it's not much of a screen. It's, it's a large mesh screen. Uh, yeah, filter out hardware and birds and stuff. Anyway, so hot air is just going to come through here and up and into the carburetor. Uh, this right here could actually be a carburetor heater or it could be the cabin heat. They look exactly the same. There's no real distinction between the two. Excuse me, no, no big deal between the two. They look the same. So air is coming in one end, it flows through and out the other end. 
What's the big danger with something like this? Exhaust leaks. Exhaust leaks. Exhaust leaks are a huge danger. So you get a little crack in this thing right here. Usually it cracks over here on the end, but you get a crack in there. And uh, if it's going to carb heat, what's my danger? It'll lose a lot of power. Yeah. Could lose power if carb heat's on. If it goes into the cabin, what's the danger? Your life. Your life. Yeah. Exactly. You fall asleep and, and uh, I get a really bad headache. I can smell it, but then you go to sleep and you don't wake up. Not a good thing. So the inspection of these are critical. Actually, the whole exhaust system is, it's overlooked. It's one of those areas that's ignored and it has the worst job on the whole aircraft and nobody pays attention. I should say nobody. It's often uh, abused, ignored until there's a massive problem. And the problems manifest themselves in carbon monoxide poisoning and fire. Uh, two things that I do not want. All right, heat muffer on the exhaust. Let's see. What happens when I pull carb heat on? Okay, drop in power. Why? Because now we are using expanded air. I can go with that. So we got expanded air. Why is it expanded? Because it's hot. Okay, it's hot. What else happens? Alternate door. Uh, you gotta be louder for the microphone. Alternate door open. Alternate air door. Well, alternate air door really isn't carb heat per se. So I'm talking strictly a carb heat. Now remember alternate air door just takes warm air from around the engine. So it's not necessarily tied to the exhaust. So it's not quite as hot. It's actually quite a bit cooler, that alternate air door. Uh, let's see, there's a loss of power. Do, that's what I was gonna write, do to less dense air. So I have less dense air coming into the carburetor. What happens to my fuel air ratio? It's rich. It's rich. I'm actually being su unpleasantly surprised in lab by people not getting the concept. I'm like, what? Well, you're here for the first four weeks, right? So we go up in altitude. What happens to the air? Less dense. Less dense. That means that do I need want more or less fuel at that point? Less fuel. Less fuel. If I have the same amount of fuel, what happens? Rich. Rich. All right. So we have less dense air, so I'm gonna have a loss of power because I have less dense air. Also, the carburetor is gonna run a little bit richer. So what do we do to correct that? Push the carb heat back in, that's how you. <laughs> you could lean it. Uh, let's see, less dense air. So RPM drop is normal. even with no ice. Oh, let's talk about this. So let's say I'm, um, and when am I most likely to get carb ice? Idle. Okay, idle, but it can happen anywhere, all right? So how would I know if I have a fixed pitch propeller that I'm getting carburetor ice at any power setting? RPM, RPM starts dropping. So I'm either idling on the ground or I'm flying and I'm not touching anything. I'm watching the RPM come down, come down, come down. Now the engine's gonna start running a little rough, right? Cause it's, it's ice is building up in the carburetor. It's blocking the passages. It's not smooth. It's not going well. Oh, I might be getting carb ice. So I reach over and I grab the carburetor heat and I pull on. What's gonna happen now? It's gonna get worse. Oh, that scared me. I'll push that back in. No? All right, so pull it out, leave it out. It's gonna get worse. Why is it gonna get worse? Because I introduced hot air, I interrupted the fuel air mixture, and what else am I introducing into the engine now? Water and ice, right? So it's gonna get worse. So this can get worse. Then it's gonna get better all on its own, right? Then I push in the carburetor heat, what's gonna happen? Even better. Even better for a little while. Then the ice will build up, repeat. Um, so if that's the case, why not just fly around with carb heat on all the time, just to be safe? Just not okay, one, it's not filtered. Two, less efficient. It's hot air into the engine. That's not a good idea. 
Well, when you're introducing hot air, remember air is a cooling component even inside the engine. It's just, it's not a good idea. You can end up with detonation. You can even, if the air gets hot enough, you can actually have, uh, it, you're, you can have your fuel air mixture light off inside of the intake system. It gets, has to get really hot. It's not going to get that hot with the carb heat, but just saying. Let's see. So use of carb heat at high power settings. can cause detonation, but then again, if you're using it appropriately and it's cold and it's ice, yeah, maybe not. Can I tell you my little scare? So, took off, I told you guys, took off from, it was a pretty short runway. And uh, my daughter with, I think it's probably one of her first flights. And we took off and cleared the end of the runway, about 100 feet, and there's nothing but great vineyards below me. And I just, that fast, it went 200 RPM drop. And that, tell you, that gets your attention right now. The poo came out a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, it's like, <laughs> ruined those pants. Anyway. So, you know, you instantly like, okay, start, you know, what am I going to do? And, and uh, you know, everybody says your instinct is going to be to turn around, but don't do it because you're not high enough. And so I'm like, okay, but it's still running. It's just 200 RPM low, waiting for the next thing to fail. So you start going through the mental checklist, you know, okay, well, is it carb heat? No, it was a very hot day. Um, there, sorry, was it carb ice? Probably not because I full power. It didn't do it at idle. Uh, did I lose a magneto? Good possibility. That would do it. Right, but I still got the other one. Things are going well, so um, gained enough altitude, and I'm like, okay, things are safe. Let's you know troubleshoot a little bit. So, what should I try to do a mag check? Sure. I don't think I'd want to turn my mags off in flight. <laughs> Let's think that through. What if it was a mag? And I'm like, okay, so I'm both. I go right. Yeah, that killed it. Let's go back to both. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> And let me tell you what happens when you accidentally turn off an engine while it's at high RPM and go back. You hear a very loud bang, right? Because, and what's that happening? After fire. So I'm filling a bunch of fuel into my exhaust and then going back and you hear this loud explosion. What does that do to the exhaust? Well, it puts a huge stress in the exhaust and blows the baffles apart inside because inside of it, there's all these little plates and stuff and you explode those. And that's a whole other problem we'll get into in a little bit. So uh, that's not a good idea, but uh, nothing wrong with uh, trying the carb heat. So I pulled the carb heat, and what should I see? And I got nothing. What does that mean? Carb heat flap just went, and uh, what happened is uh, whoever had installed the carburetor, and it was not me, uh, and the carb heat box used the wrong size bolt. They used a 3 sixteenths inside of a quarter inch hole. So you have a big hole with a little bolt that just vibrates around, and it vibrated until it wore a hole in the little sheet metal. This little sheet metal thing right there, they just wore a hole all the way through it and there was nothing but a, so. That was straight after maintenance or happened after a while? Uh, they put the wrong bolt in, I'm assuming, when they overhauled the engine. So that took about 200 hours for it to wear itself through. And it's just, um, and the annual inspection is just, I, you don't notice that you have the wrong size bolt because the bolt head's covering it. You can't see what's behind it. You assume things is the right thing. Don't assume. What? What airport were you making? Uh, Kingdon. All right. Can't remember if I turned that on. Uh, okay. Um, air duct. <laughs> air duct. Also called scat duct. And I have a note here. And I'll share it with you. Do not Google the word scat tube. There are very sick people in this world. Scat tube? Scat tube. Yeah. So anyway, that's this... There's scat and skeet, and there, oops, there's different uh, styles, but that is this type of ducting. 
So it's very common. It is not a lot of fun to work with because it's got this spiral wound stuff inside of here. And uh, I don't know. A lot of your flex stuff, the H bag stuff is that, just like that. Uh, okay. But yeah, this has got to be the right size to fit mm -hmm. over stuff. And, and then, uh, oh, it's got this little string that goes around there that's glued on but once the string comes loose it unravels and this unravels from the inside and it's just it's oh it's a wonderful joy to work with this stuff no. but anyway that's your uh, high temp duck high temp no temp all right so we got that and we're not going to google that word okay um i have never worked on this system nor have i seen it but i know there's a q a question about it Alcohol injection. It's not what you think it is. Um, it is injecting. It's injecting a spray. There's a spray ring located in the carburetor inlet that actually sprays alcohol up inside the carburetor for anti ice. So, oops, inject. Let me write this so you can actually read it. Alcohol injection. It is, we'll say, an, an injected spray of alcohol from a ring located at the carburetor inlet. And that will prevent ice. See, so the problem with that is one, you need an alcohol tank. Two, now you're limited. You run out of alcohol. I never run out of hot air in my airplane either. All right. Speaking of ice, I'll spell nice at a T word. Three types of ice one there's impact ice and you'll get a lot more ice stuff when you get into ice and rain removal in their second year but <clears throat> as a precursor because we're talking about induction system that is when snow and ice hit the aircraft And what temperature do you suppose that's going to happen? Below 32. All right. Yeah. Happens at 32 degrees or less. What is the big danger, engine-wise, with impact ice? Uh, clogging the air inlet. You got it. Clogs the air inlet. So it can block the air filter. How do I get rid of it? I switch over to, you can't, but you switch over to the exhaust. Can't. Okay. Well, we can send Ken out with a little broom. <laughs> Reach around the front and knock it off. Because <laughs> he's brave. All right, so it can block the filter. There's nothing you can do about it. Once it blocks a filter, it's blocked. Well, unless you change altitude and go somewhere where it starts melting, but you're not going to get rid of it. So, um, carb heat. will not melt the ice but but what Justin it provides uh, unfiltered air there you go provide or an alternate yeah. uh, what happens if I don't have the carb heat option because I have a fuel injected engine Alternate air door will open up all on its own usually. All right. We have evaporation ice. And that is when caused when fuel evaporates.
in the throttle. Throttle area. We talked about that quite a bit. Uh, I think week one, because you have to have some latent heat. You need to have heat to have the evaporation, so the heat's got to come from somewhere. It comes from the surrounding air. If the surrounding air is dropped below freezing and has a lot of moisture, you're going to develop ice. And develop ice, and there you go. What temperature range do you suppose this can happen from? Well, I heard any. Who said any? Any's damn good answer, actually. And you said? Up to 70 degrees, I thought. 80? Any? <laughs> <laughs> uh, can happen from 32. Why 32? Because if it's below 32 degrees, you can impact ice. It's already frozen. It's already frozen. <laughs> so, yeah. It doesn't necessarily impact ice, but yeah, I like where you're going with that. It can happen from 32 to 100 degrees. Uh, and that would have to be pretty humid. So 100 degrees, wind, humidity. It is over 50%. Ah, that might be a question somewhere, but it's 32 to 100 degrees. All right, I'm going to move this over. That's fair. Yes. <laughs> Have you ever known me to talk in Celsius? I mean, it could, it could be in Celsius. Look, we beat the British once. I'm not going to Celsius. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Yeah, <laughs> good point. <laughs> Probably not going to happen. It usually doesn't get that hot outside. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. What uh, what kind of carburetors? Well, never mind. It's common in carburetors. In float carbs, common in float. We'll say float carbs. Um, can happen in a pressure carb. Not very likely. So can happen in pressure carb. It can happen in a pressure carb. And let's see, not likely in fuel injection. Why is it not likely in fuel injection? Or we can back up. Common in float carbs. Talk. Why? Why is it possible in a pressure carb? Yeah, very good. Fuel is still mixed at the air inlet and has to go through the pipes. And um, even though in a pressure carb it's inverted, so you'd have the, the throttle valve and then the discharge nozzle, say the other way around. Um, why is it not likely in a fuel injected engine? Because you have the fuel being introduced at the intake port. At the intake port, and the temperature at the intake port is. At a couple hundred degrees. It's pretty dang high. It's right next to that hot. It's at the hot cylinder, so not likely there. Um, and let's see, last one is throttle ice. And that's when ice is going to start developing around the throttle. In my mind, it's really another form of refrigeration ice because it's kind of what's happening, but it tends to collect around the throttle. And it's most likely to happen at part throttle, so it happens. As a pilot, there's only two types of ice, outside the carburetor and inside the carburetor, so that's what I'm thinking. So more likely uh, during landing. With prop driving engine. In other words, you're windmilling. So you, you're, the wind is coming through. You've got the throttle really clo closed all the way back. And the wind hitting the propeller is driving the propeller, which is driving the big air pump. Big air pump is really sucking. So what is my manifold pressure going to do? Drop way down. Drop way down. So. so same thing, common in carbs and float. 
float carbs. Can't happen. And pressure carb. And not likely. And fuel injection. All right, trying to think if there's anything else we need to talk about about induction systems. When would an induction system leak be most noticeable? <clears throat> oh, God, I'm glad somebody got that. Why? I was waiting for one. It's hamsters, very slow. Vacuum on the, uh, on the manifold side of the throttle plate. Okay, everybody agree? I was listening. <laughs> All right, so when would an, an intake leak be most noticeable? At, At idle. Why? Because the vacuum makes any change into uh, makes more noticeable. All right, because there's a large vacuum inside of the manifold system, so there's a greater differential pressure. So you have the very large vacuum in the manifold. You have a lot of pressure on the outside, 14.7 to be exact. And that when you're at idle, you have the suction, it's going to want to draw air more in. So wide open throttle, the pressures are relatively equal, so you don't notice it quite as bad. So what are the symptoms of an intake leak? High idle RPM. High idle RPM? Why? That's very good. Because of when you're bringing more air. Bringing more air. It's like opening the throttle a little bit more. Is it going to run properly, uh, mixture-wise? Uh, going to run lean because it's air is usually bypassing the sensing element. Um, all right. One thing I didn't talk about is sniffle valves. And I don't believe there are any Q&A questions. I don't think the FAA gets into it. But uh, on fuel-injected engines, they will often put a little valve. And what's that? Is it when the engine's sick? Yeah, just like that. All right, so here's my, my intake tube here. And, oh, I don't know if I can draw something crude here. There's a little ball that'll sit. Yeah, little, it's a little check ball. And what happens is it falls down and there's little openings that allow fuel to kind of drain out when the engine is not operating. But as soon as you turn on the engine, you've got a low pressure here, right? And high pressure, it's going to pull this ball up, and the ball's going to seat and block it off. So, it's a cal it's a leak when it's open. So, do you remember that picture I showed you last week of that? Uh, lock. Thank you, hydraulic lock. That was one of the. That was the second question I asked. And I said, wow, you know, who, who did that? And you did this by over priming it. The second question is, hey, are the sniffle valves clean and open on this thing? Or are, they, are they gummed and stuck closed? And then they inspected it and found that they were actually stuck closed. Nobody, had, the, the aircraft had sat for quite a while, if I remember the story correctly. And so little sniffle valves were actually um, gummed up and no fuel was allowed to drain out through it, so which would have possibly prevented that. So on an annual inspection, you want to check those sniffle valves, make sure they operate freely. Number one, you want to make sure they operate freely and they open up to let excess fuel drain out. And you want to make sure that they close because if they don't close, what do you get? Extra unmetered air. Uh, extra unmetered air. And that means you're going to be running lean, lean again. All right. Um, Does those have a little lever that you press them down to open them? Mm -mm. No, no. You're, no, no, you're. I think you're thinking of quick drains. Okay. Yeah, the same same concept, but th these are all automatic. If I suspected an intake leak, what could I do as a mechanic to prove it or disprove that there's an intake leak? Mm -hmm. See if what? It runs. With the throttle closed. See if it runs with the throttle closed. Possibly. Oh, it's kind of. Yeah. 
Kind of hard to tell if the throttle's, you wouldn't be able to do it. Come on, let's see, let's, here's some good, good ideas here. You guys are sharp. Soap bubbles. Would you run the engine? No. How would you do that? Um, some air. Shop air. Shop air. Yeah, you're right on. You're right on. An old school way of doing it. Uh, not on airplanes. <laughs> you don't know, see why. But uh, you know, old timers, they would uh, they would talk about run the engine and take some ether. You, you know what ether is? It's starting fluid and stuff, and spray it around the engine where you suspect the leak. And because it's highly volatile, as it goes, finds its way in and hits the engine, what's the RPM going to do? Go up. So, so that was one way to do it. But you can't do that with an airplane because there's a big old fan up front. So one of the things you can do is take some shop air. Yeah, that's what Juan said that. Um, one, of, one of the my favorite ways of doing shop air is to not explode things. Um, is to use a vacuum cleaner. So use the outlet of a vacuum cleaner. So every good shop in aviation is going to have a vacuum shop vac that has inlet and outlet air. Just reverse the hose so it blows because that's a nice high volume amount of air. And is that a constant displacement type pump or a centrifugal type pump? Yeah, so you're not going to break things. So you can do that and then spray some... Uh, so Windex actually works, Windex will bubble, but some soapy water. Uh, same thing with exhaust systems. It's exactly how I test exhaust systems every year. And if I don't have that, what I'll do is I'll take a, a shop rag and I'll use compressed air and just blow it up in and the rag lets so enough leak out. Exactly you place the soap? Where? Where do you place the soap? Everywhere, huh? all over. So like if we went back to Uh, this one, I would really be concerned about these couplings. That would be my, my, my best guess. Secondly, oh, there's a lot of passages in here. I would check, check the intercooler um, connection here. But I would check all of that. All right, so... Uh -huh. Other than that, I can't. No. Leave them on. Leave them on. And you would push air through the intake? Yep. And you would see bubbles because it's leaking. Yep. The now, another way to do it, glad I'm thinking of this through. Another way to do it, uh, put a compression tester on one of the cylinders. Instead of putting that cylinder on top dead center of compression, I would put it on. Intake stroke. So the, in, the intake valve is open and just use a compression tester. And that's gonna then go through the intake pipe, through the intake valve, into the intake pipe, pressurize the whole system. And sometimes what I'll do is I'll just take a shop rag and plug up where the air normally comes in. So I pressurize the whole thing. So there are different ways to do it, but those are two easy ways to do it. And soap it up. All right, exhaust systems. We'll define it. Scavenging system that collects and disposes of high temperature poisonous gases. Is what mandatory? The inspections for leaks. <sighs> no. no? Mm -mm. Well, it's not mandatory that you do a leak check on the intake system. It, you know, it depends on what you mean by mandatory. It may be in like a, a, a beach or a Cessna. Yeah, I was just reading comply with the heater muffler leak test and inspection as per SI 0558. So you don't have to do that. If you look at uh, uh, FAR 43 Appendix D, there's the scope and detail of what's required by law. And 
you're required to inspect the intake system, but it doesn't say how, it doesn't say to leak check it, you just have to look at it. And in much the same way, it says it for the exhaust. So you're just, you can do a visual. I don't. Uh, exhaust is, is just too deadly. I'll do a pressure test on an exhaust, on everything, uh, but I won't pressurize the intake system. Uh, collects and disposes, now I'm thinking of other things I could say, uh, of high temperature, poisonous gas. So speaking of intake systems, one of the other things about Lycoming, if you guys notice when you're working on putting your engine up on the test stand and you have the oil sump, it has those little tubes that come out. And you're giving much thought to how those tubes are held in place. They're swedged in place. And what that means is what they, they, those are steel and the uh, sump is aluminum. So they take the aluminum sump after it's made and they take the steel pipes and they push them inside. And then they're swedged. And swedging is really, it's a tool that goes in and has little rollers. And it goes in there and you roll it and these rollers press out really hard and make a little bead on the inside and force it in there. And sometimes those tubes come loose after years and years of use and that's a great place for intake leaks. So the repair is really simple. You just re-swedge them. Care to guess what a Lycoming re-swedger tool costs? Last time I looked, about $5,000 per, and there's three different sizes. And does it cost 5000 for each size, or? Mm-hmm. How are they operated on that one? Is it air? No, actually, it's just a big nut on the end. You tighten it up, and it pushes little, it has like, oh, uh, I think mine had three, three little rollers. And so you put it in there and just give it a couple turns and tighten it up, a couple more turns, take it out. Uh, let's see, exhaust gases. Well, contain CO, carbon monoxide. That's poison. I think we talked about this before. If you have carbon monoxide poisoning, what is the cure? Oxygen, oxygen how? Yeah, pressure, Hyperbaric chamber, high pressure oxygen. And the only place I know of in uh, the area that has that is Mercy Hospital up that way. And a hyperbaric, I had a picture of that I'd show you. A hyperbaric oxygen chamber is what they use to test you for um, what's that? No, I was saying for claustrophobia because, <laughs> because it's a tube. It looks like a, a tube about that big around <laughs> and uh, puts you in that thing and yeah, no thanks. Uh, but anyway, it's better than dying, I suppose. So let's see. That's open to debate. Uh, they're hot and can cause... A fire. And if you have a fire in an airplane, there's nowhere to go. And that is not something that I really want to think much about. Material. All right. So what are these exhaust systems made out of? Well, most of the time it's corrosion resistant. Steel. What does corrosion resistant steel mean? What kind of steel is that? Stainless. Okay, if I'm stainless. What is sta what it, what makes it stainless? What's what's the it's stainless, it's steel, but it's got an alloying agent. What is that alloying agent? What's that? I don't know. <laughs> what are you allergic to? Stainless steel. All right. Well, yeah, but what makes it stainless? It's just steel with something added to it. What is the thing that's added? Nickel. nickel. There we go. So it's just steel. So it's with <laughs> nickel. With nickel in it. Or manel, which is a nickel copper.
it's possibly ceramic coated. Oh, good. I was going to talk about this. So here we go. Um, I'll just make this statement. Do not, do not weld repair in the field unless you know the base metal. It is just so easy to whip out, well, if you're a welder and you have the stuff, you see a crack in exhaust. The problem is you're doing an inspection on an airplane, you find a cracked exhaust, that means the exhaust has to come out, get boxed up, and sent out to usually a certified repair station that does exhaust systems. <coughs> and certified repair stations that do exhaust systems usually have a giant steel table that is unmovable, and it has the fixtures on it and they know exactly where to they'll bolt it up to this table that matches your engine and they will weld everything then relieve the stresses and then send it back. But you're thinking, oh, it's just a little crack. I just got a little TIG weld on there and I'm all done. And uh, it's, well, I'll be honest, I've done a lot of them. And uh, usually what happens is the customer talks you into it and you fix my exhaust and you go to do it and you realize the reason why it's cracked is because it's the same thickness as a razor blade. And so here you are welding razor blades together and um, it doesn't last. You know, you're, be it's, you're better off not doing that and sending it off to a repair station who will actually measure it and send it back and say, look, you know, this stuff is gone. It's too thin. It's razor blade thin. You know, it's just going to crack again. You need a new one and then you put a new one on. So that's the right way to do it. But to be honest, for fun, I used to weld razor blades together just to keep them practice. I had a whole stack of it. I'd weld stuff. So if you get good welding razor blades, you can weld old exhaust systems. But anyway, I believe that's a Q&A response there. And it's actually the right thing to do. Uh, let's see. Number three. We'll say two types. Two types of systems. Well, I'll tell you what, before we get into the two types of systems, we will take a break and when we come back, we will talk about the two types of systems. <laughs> 